Okay, guys, so this is day one of the Progressive Era, and we are going to, and we are in historical time period seven. Okay, this is the theme. Uh, we have a progressive movement going on, and the progressive movement is um, the culmination of the Gilded Era. Remember, we had started with uh, corruption and we are ending with reform. So this is uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is CCOT, change and continuity over time. So remember populist movement with the farmers and the uh, factory workers going into the progressive era that we're talking about right now, and ultimately we'll move on into the New Deal in the 1930s under Franklin Roosevelt. So who were these guys? Uh, remember we talked about politicians that wanted change, uh, mugwumps, and they desired this return to um, a pre-monopoly era where there was a progressive reform, remember that second great awakening. And the uh, emerging middle class, your merchants, your lawyers, um, these are the people that are going to drive this, this progressive movement. They believed instead of laissez-faire government that government needed to get involved with the public interest and restore order to society. This is a definite movement, a definite uh, time period and era. And sadly, we're going to see not just good things come out of the progressive era, but we're going to see an increase in uh, nativism or uh, anti-immigrant. Um, we're going to see a rise uh, in the Ku Klux Klan. We've got the Jim Crow laws still going on. And some white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are going to be pushing their agenda. Okay, so these are some of the uh, main reform issues. And uh, competition and monopolies were we're taking over. We're going to talk, we've talked about some of those, Standard Oil, U.S. Steel, and so forth. Uh, because of that vertical and horizontal integration, a lot of people were put out of business. And then a lot of the politicians were um, dominated by these monopolies. And again, remember, we had corruption at every level. We talked about the political machines and the political machines in, in the big cities, especially um, meeting the immigrants and basically selling services for votes and um, Tammany Hall. OK, Tammany Hall in New York City, the most notable example we talked about with um, Boss Tweed. Colleges are uh, growing because of, remember, the Morrell Act that we talked about that Abraham Lincoln signed in the uh, during the Civil War, 1860s. Well, those colleges grew. They're going to not just be uh, for clergy or for doctors and lawyers, but they're going to develop all these other departments, social studies departments, yay, uh, economics and, and so forth, and expanding. And John Dewey is one of the major educators who is advocating learning by doing rather than just um, studying the classics, the classic literature that has been in vogue. We're going to have several uh, folks writing, and they are going to be uh, writing in magazines and in books. And Henry Demers Lloyd is considered one of the very first investigative journalist, and he is going to be criticizing Standard Oil, but it'll lead the way for other what we call muckrakers. They are stirring up the muck in order to expose problems that can be taken care of. Jacob Rees we talked about. Jacob Rees is a definite muck raker who is going to be taking pictures, one of the very first to use flash photography. And because of his pictures, 
politicians are going to see these pictures, be appalled by uh, conditions, and they are going to enact laws and regulations to take care of some of these horrible conditions. This is one of his famous pictures. Uh, if you read the, the uh, rhetoric on the left, he's talking about the apartment. It was one of two in, so of three in two adjoining buildings. And 12 people were sleeping, men and women, in this, in this one room. And you can see how they're just kind of stacked in on one another. Another one of his famous pictures, this is a sweatshop where they're doing piecework. Wouldn't want to walk down this alley. It's called Bandit's Roost. And you can see that one guy's holding a club and um, dangerous. This is a cigar maker's tenement. He's having his children uh, and wife help him. You can just guess on that one. And this is uh, just kind of showing the squalor of how people were living during that time. This one just makes makes you sad. Okay, so uh, there was a movement called Social Gospel, and Social Gospel is basically God-related. And if um, if Salvation Army, you can say you can see the um, the the bells at Christmas time and so forth when they're going for donations. One of the uh, most, well, one of the many famous writers is Lincoln Stephans, and he wrote a book called Chain of the Cities. Basically, he is um, exposing those political machines and the, um, the voting fraud that was going on. Love the mustache, too. This gal is the one that you really need to know, Ida Tarbell. And Ida Tarbell is, um, uh, she was a writer for McClure's Magazine. Her father, if you remember, um, we talked about the first commercial oil well in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Her father actually was a wildcatter. He owned several uh, oil wells. And Rockefeller came and wanted to buy them. Well, her father didn't want to sell them. He, he enjoyed uh, the work and he did not want to sell. So... Rockefeller says fine, and when Tarbell's father went to sell the oil, Rockefeller, remember that vertical integration, had bought all the oil refineries, and Tarbell's father had no place to sell. Okay, hopefully you guys said that you saw the oil cans and you saw the factory in the background. Of course, Rockefeller on the collar, and he basically has control. So here's another one. I'll give you a minute. All right, hopefully you said something about how this octopus is standard oil. It's got control of the White House over here. It's got control of uh, Congress. It's got its tentacles out. You can see like the bankers. Um, it's got control of all the oil wells. So this is just showing the complete control that Rockefeller and Standard Oil had. Here's another very important uh, muckraker, Upton Sinclair. He writes a book called The Jungle. And you're going to have a uh, little ed puzzle about the jungle. Uh, basically, he is talking about the meatpacking industry in Chicago. And uh, he wrote the book about immigrants and, and how they're 
um, kind of rounded up just like the beef and uh, processed. And But in, in writing this book, he was he gave so much detail about the filth and the horrible conditions that people were actually sickened when they when they read it, including Theodore Roosevelt. And because of this book, um, Theodore Roosevelt is going to push for the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. So this is just showing by uh, these muckrakers showing muck, raking up that muck, how, how change can happen. It's another um, problem during this time. There are going to be pushing for child labor laws, but you can see here the children um, are still working during this early time period. A nut famous Lewis Hine picture showing a young lady in the textile industry, only 11 years old. These are the uh, kids, the coal miners. We've seen this, this Lewis Hine again, showing the poor kid, kid child labor. So these progressive activists, activists, they're um, trying to improve conditions for the poor people, for labor, for children, uh, for women. And put a little star by this one, Jane Adams, A. W. Adams. We talked about her once before. She's the founder of Settlement Houses, uh, the most famous being Whole House in Chicago. And we talked about how this is much like Providence House. One of her protégés was Florence Kelly, and Florence Kelly is going to uh, be a champion of the welfare of women, African-American consumers, and children. A court case is going to be uh, decided, Miller, Miller versus Oregon, and in that they decide that women are more tender in can't work long, long hours. And so they're going to uphold this Oregon law that limits women to working only 10 hours a day. More of Lewis Hine or Jacob Rees. I'm not sure who uh, did this one. Okay, in the last um, um, unit, we did talk about the Triangle Shirtwaist Company and the fire that re, uh, resulted in numerous immigrant young women dying. It was the worst disaster in New York City, and it's going to result in new laws, fire laws, and regulations um, in the in, in industry. Remember, many of the women jumped from those high uh, ninth and tenth floor areas to um, and landed, and there were no survivors of those that jumped. Okay, we're going to move on. Now remember, there's political reform, moral reform, social reform, and one of our most famous political reformers, love that hair, is Robert La Follette. And Robert La Follette had been a governor of Wisconsin and then a senator of Wisconsin, and he is very progressive. He is going to destroy the political machine in Wisconsin, and he is going to um, institute many commissions to improve the quality of life in uh, that in, in the state of Wisconsin. Then he's going to move on to a national job and he's going to push for the direct primary, um, which is going to be ultimately uh, taken. We now have direct primaries for president and um, other positions. He pushes for the initiative, the referendum, and the recall. And we're going to have um, a little bit more research, I mean, uh, uh, a little worksheet on that initiative, referendum, and recall. This is important. If you take the initiative, you get a, uh, that, yeah, I'm sorry, a uh, bunch of signatures on a proposition. You can take it to 
any level of government, and if you have enough signatures, they have to consider your proposal. So this is citizens taking the initiative for a law, a referendum, our citizens voting on a law, and recall is we made a mistake, we've voted for the wrong guy, and we need a recall election. And again, that's done with petition. 17th Amendment is going to be passed. Uh, you're going to have the Progressive Amendments, 16, 17, 18, and 19. 16th, of course, is income tax. And then um, spoil system. Remember, we passed the Pendleton Act, the Civil Service Act, that they are really going to put that into effect at the state level. Other states are going to follow Wisconsin's example, and some of those examples are Hiram Johnson in California, Charles Evan Hughes, who's going to run for president in New York, and Woodrow Wilson, who's going to run and become a president in New Jersey. So um, La Follette, very, very influential. influential. He's actually uh, in the uh, statuary in the Capitol building. So La Follette you see often on the AP test, and uh, this is Dig Sid, okay? So if you remember La Follette, that's direct election of senators, initiative referendum and recall, government regulation of business, civil service reform, income tax at the state level, which we have here in Louisiana, and the direct primary. Also, no more handing someone your ballot now, no more uh, uh, having to vote in front of other people. Now you've got the booth, the secret ballot, and they call that the Australian ballot. And we have this now. So this is, again, uh, to keep the political machines from sabotaging the vote, reducing bribery. And um, the downside was some voters that didn't have good English, now they couldn't get the help to vote. Um, sometimes the help from the political machines. The Galveston hurricane of 1900, which is uh, a horrible, horrible hurricane that is going to kill thousands of people in Galveston. Uh, they have a, had a political machine in effect and they realized that they couldn't take care of things. And so they, um, after this disaster, they appoint commissioners and realize that to be efficient, you had to have people who knew what they were doing. So full-time city managers are going to be hired, and ultimately 400 cities, including Shreveport, Louisiana, are going to adopt this commission style of government. And this is going to eliminate the power of many of the political machines. So we'll be talking more about the progressives tomorrow, and uh, you will be having that Ed Puzzle on the jungle.